you're staying safe and healthy. Uh, and even though these are difficult and trying times, I, I hope that you're able to spend them with your immediate family and that the extra time spent with family has led to strengthened relationships. By this point, most of you are likely aware that Dr. Marlon Conley passed away on Friday, April the 10th, just before his 85th birthday. However, I also know that over the last several years, there have been a lot of members who have joined our congregation who likely have no idea who Dr. Conley was uh, or what impact he's had on our congregation. And if you will indulge me, I would like to, to spend a few minutes talking about Dr. Conley. Uh, Dr. Marlon Conley was the first full-time pulpit minister of the Bellevue Church of Christ. He and his wife, Nancy, came to Bellevue in 1967 and served for the next 26 and a half years until 1993. And actually, when Dr. Conley retired from full-time pulpit ministry, uh, he came back in 2007 and served for another five years as associate minister. Now, the same year that he started at Bellevue in 1967, he also started as a professor at David Lipscomb College, now known as Lipscomb University. During his tenure at Lipscomb, Dr. Conley served 12 years as the chair of the speech communication department and six years as the Battle Barrett Baxter chair of preaching. But back to Bellevue, uh, when Dr. Conley started in 1967, uh, our congregation had fewer than 100 members, but when he left in 1993, we had well over 700. However, Dr. Conley's impact on our congregation and on the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be measured in membership statistics. Uh, Dr. Conley was a man of God. He was a Bible scholar. As a matter of fact, he knew more about the Bible than any person I've ever known in my life. Uh, he was a Holy Land guide. From 1972 until 2002, um, he last actually 2008, uh, he led 25 trips to the Holy Land. Uh, he was an incredible communicator, and he was a true minister. You know, thinking about him being an incredible communicator, I think about all of the unique and effective ways that he had of communicating. You know, find any longtime member at Bellevue once we're able to get back together and ask them about things like signpost words, or preach a little, sing a little, or chalk talks. Or ask them about sermon illustrations built around detailed uh, historical accounts from World War II or around the center column personal interest story on the front page of the Wall Street Journal or on old Burma shave advertisements. And you'll begin to get a little hint of the tools that Dr. Conley used to effectively communicate the truth of God's word to so many people. I think about how many who were lost in their sin that first received the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ through the personal ministry of Dr. Conley, through his teaching, through his preaching, and how there's no way we will ever know the full impact that he had on reaching those who were lost for Jesus Christ. I think about how much time he spent teaching and mentoring and encouraging preachers and how today those men fill pulpits around the globe. Quite simply, Dr. Conley's impact for the gospel of Jesus Christ cannot be measured. On a personal note, Dr. Conley was my mentor. He was my friend. And he was quite simply the finest preacher and teacher that I have ever known. Without his influence, I doubt I would have spent any of the last 25 years uh, preaching and teaching. But he encouraged me and taught me to do just that. There's no way that I would ever be able to effectively communicate what kind of an impact he has had on my life and my relationship with Jesus Christ. And I feel confident that there are many in this congregation who would echo those same sentiments. Today, we grieve for his family. We grieve for his wife, Nancy. We grieve for his children, for Pam, for Andy, for Philip. We grieve for their children. We grieve for the loss of this great man, but we rejoice and knowing that a true man of God is now home with his Lord.
church, do you love Jesus? Oh, yes, we love Jesus. Are you sure you love Jesus? Yes, we sure we love Jesus. Tell us why you love Jesus. This is why we love Jesus. Because he burst on me and we sing it all. scriptures from the Old Testament. The first being from Exodus chapter 14. The Israelites are fleeing from the Egyptians at this point in time, and they are under extreme duress. The army is bearing down on them from uh, Egypt, and Moses has to stop and remind the people in verse 14 that the Lord will fight for you, and you have only to be silent be still. What a wonderful thought that no matter what the circumstances, no matter what anxiety, stress, whatever we're going through, that the Lord is always with us and that we only need to be still and to know that he is God. The second is from Psalms chapter 46. David here is writing a psalm, a hymn, a song, and in verse 10, he says, to be still and know that I am God, as his worship that day, as he is writing. Both of these scriptures are coming from very different circumstances. One, the Israelites are fleeing the Egyptians. David is probably in his palace writing this praise to God. And yet they both come to the same conclusion that we need just be still and know that, that God is. And so, as we commune with the Lord today, I would ask that we be still and listen to the Creator and listen to what He has to say to us today. Let us pray for the bread. Father Creator, as we take a moment to pause, worship you today. Help us to be still and to listen to what you would have to tell us. We thank you so much that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that you are always with us no matter what we go through. As we take this bread, help us to remember that and to reflect on that. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
again, Father, we come to you this morning asking and praying that we would still our minds and still our hearts and to reflect on what you have done for us in any and all circumstances. And we ask and pray that you would bless us as we take this cup and we reflect on what Jesus has done for us. It's in your son Jesus' name that we pray. Even though we're uh, all at home, I, I hope you will take some time and find a Bible because uh, this morning uh, or whenever you're watching this, we're going to be looking at some passages and maybe it doesn't feel normal to grab your Bible and, and go through it while you're at home, but I hope you'll grab a Bible and follow along uh, in the lesson. Uh, also, maybe grab a notebook, something to take some notes in uh, as we go through this lesson to help you be more engaged uh, with God's Word. But I want to start off um, saying, if you've got the Bible, uh, go ahead and be turning to Acts chapter 2. That'll be one of a number of passages that we'll go to. But I want to ask you a question. I want all of us to think about a question. And that is, are there any lessons that we have learned from this pandemic, from the stay-at-home order uh, of, of having this kind of new normal in our lives right now? Uh, I know that it's it's challenging, it's stressful, um, it's it's strange, it's weird. We all feel that. But are there any things that we have learned about ourselves, about our lives, uh, that we think will be helpful moving forward? I'm sure there are. Uh, and there's something I wanted to share with you that I've learned about myself through all of this. Just like many of you, I I tend to be very busy and and my family olivia and sarah and kate and i we all are very busy and we we over schedule ourselves uh, and again i know many of you are in the same boat we have a hard time saying no to anything and we're just busy people um, and when i think about all the things that we're involved in um, you know beyond work you know i'm part owner in a firm uh, we have a lot of employees we have a lot of clients that we have to take care of there's a lot of responsibilities there we have church responsibilities. I'm involved in teaching and occasionally in preaching. 
Uh, Olivia is involved in sign language ministry. She's heavily involved in Last to Leaders. Uh, we've got uh, family related things that we're involved in. Uh, my girls are really into music. They, they both play multiple instruments. They have all kinds of lessons and concerts. They're both in chorus and, and have, uh, at least prior to this, had all kinds of choral concerts that they were involved in. Uh, from, a, from a hobby perspective, uh, I, I'm really involved in running. We like biking, we like hiking. Uh, I dabble in guitar, dabble in photography, but I'm busy with those things. Um, the girls have school, obviously. Um, school looks very different these days, but they have school and they're involved in a lot of extracurricular activities there. Uh, we also do a lot of things for entertainment. Uh, I love live music and I go to a lot of concerts. Uh, I think about last year, I don't have an exact number, but I probably went to at least 50 concerts last year. Uh, not to mention uh, going to musicals, going to movies, and spending a lot of time going out to eat. And the reality in the last couple of months has been that many of those things that I was busy with, that our family was busy with, they're no longer options. Uh, there are no concerts. There, there's no going to the movie theater. There's no restaurants to go out to eat to. Um, and it has taught me a lesson about simplicity because while this time is incredibly challenging, and there's, there's all kinds of stresses. I mean, I, I think about the stresses that I have related to my business. Our business has been uh, dramatically impacted. And I, I worry about our employees and, and retaining those employees and, and maintaining our business. I worry about the economy, uh, what kind of a toll this is gonna have on you know, the economy of our country and, and our world and, and what kind of impact that's gonna have on, on all of us. And there's a lot of things that I worry about, but I noticed a couple of weeks into this that even though there were all these things that were difficult and challenging and worrisome that I found I was pretty content. And when I started thinking about why, you know, why do I just feel kind of at peace? I realized that for the first time, maybe in years, I was allowing myself to breathe. I didn't have anything to do, you know, at night. I didn't have a concert to go to. I didn't have a, a recital to go to. I didn't have a movie to attend. Uh, and things just simplify. And I realize that I don't have to be busy. I don't have to be filling my life, my, my life with fun things that, that I seem to believe are going to make me happy. And maybe subconsciously I had allowed myself to believe that doing all of these things was somehow going to make me happy. And now I realize that I don't have to have all this stuff in my life to be content and to be happy. And so I think this is an important lesson that I hope I remember when this is, you know, we've moved past this uh, kind of immediate phase of this pandemic. I hope that I will remember what it feels like to live a simplified life, to live in, in an environment where I can take a step back and breathe and and enjoy being with my family and enjoying just spending time together at home. But also it's made me start thinking about, does this also apply or should this also apply to my spiritual life as well? You know, there are so many activities uh, and programs that we get involved in, spiritually speaking, as part of, part of being a church. And I imagine most, if not all, of those things are fantastic. They're things that are worthy of us to be involved in, but we also can get overscheduled as it relates to our spiritual life, as it relates to church. And does it cause us, does that overscheduling cause us to lose focus on those simple things that are the most important parts of our spiritual lives, things that we need to remember to, to take time and step back and breathe and focus on those things that are most important? Are there things that we can learn about our spiritual life through this pandemic, through this opportunity to, to breathe and, and to take some time? And as I was thinking about that, I, I thought about a passage that I have taught many lessons from. I, I have done a lot of classes on this. I've preached sermons from this passage, but in Acts chapter two, where we have the birth of the Lord's church, uh, just to set the context, in Acts chapter 2, we have the day of Pentecost, as we call it. Um, and Pentecost was one of the Jewish festivals that was referred to as a pilgrimage feast. It was one where Jews from all over the known world would travel to Jerusalem to celebrate Pentecost. 
And as most of you know, uh, it was during that time that the apostles of Jesus Christ, uh, they were filled with God's Holy Spirit. And using that opportunity of all those people gathered in Jerusalem, they began to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as a result of that, the people were convicted and 3,000 were baptized and joined the church. Now, immediately in the aftermath of them joining the church, we're told about what things that that early church, those first Christians, that they were devoted to. And if I'm asking myself, what are the things that I most need to focus on in my spiritual life? What are the things that I most need to focus on as a church? What better place to look than to those very first Christians and the very first things that they were involved in? And the beautiful thing about Acts chapter 2, specifically, if you've got a Bible, open it to, to Acts 2 verse 42. Luke, uh, the, the author of Acts, tells us exactly what they were focused on. Look at verse 42. It says, and talking, they, talking about the, the 3,000 that were added to the church, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Now, in that one simple verse, Luke is telling us that there were four things that the early church was devoted to. And these are, are simple things that they were devoted to, but they're, they're incredibly fundamental to our Christian faith. And I want us to just briefly, in our time that we have together, uh, even in this virtual environment, I want us to go through those four things quickly if we can. The first thing, uh, and if you got that notebook that I mentioned at the beginning and you're willing to take notes, write down this phrase, the truth. The first thing that Luke tells us is that they were devoted to the apostles' teaching. Now, what's the significance of that to us? Because we don't have apostles today or apostles of Jesus Christ today. So what's the significance of that to us? Where, well, the word that's translated apostle just literally means that it was one who was sent. And these men that these early Christians were listening to, uh, they were apostles of Jesus Christ. And what that meant was an apostle was one who was sent on behalf of another, which meant that they were sent with the full authority of the one who sent them. And so these apostles had the full authority of Jesus Christ. They were teaching uh, they were teaching with the full authority of Jesus, the words that would have the same weight as if they were coming from Jesus. How were they able to do that? Well, they were able to do that because they were filled with God's Holy Spirit. And you don't have to do this right now, but at some point during the week, take some time and read in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, 15, and 16. In those chapters, Jesus is in the upper room with those men who are, who are going to be his apostles. And he tells them about the Holy Spirit that's going to come. And that the Holy Spirit is going to bring to their remembrance everything that Jesus did and everything that he taught. It's an incredible promise that he made to them. And because of that, they are able to teach as if you know, the, the words were coming from the mouth of Jesus to these first Christians. Well, again, what does that mean for us? Because we don't have the apostles. Well... We don't have the apostles, but we have the apostles' writings. Uh, we have their, their recordings in what we call the New Testament. So these apostles were like walking New Testaments. And the people were devoting themselves every day to listening to what these walking New Testaments have to say. And what, what is one of the things that we need to, to make a priority, that we need to focus on in our day-to-day -day Christian walk? Well, I think it's the same thing, except instead of listening to the apostles verbally, let's study what they had to say through our New Testaments. Let's study what Jesus had to say through our New Testaments, knowing that that's one of the fundamental parts of being a Christian is to be connected to God through his word. And, I, you know, I have to believe that most of us have more free time now than we did before this pandemic started. And what better time to rededicate ourselves to the daily study of God's Word, to making that a part of our normal routine of one of those simple things that we focus on, that we focus on the truth, the truth that comes from God's Word. The second thing that I want you to write down is the word, is the phrase, the tie. So we had the truth, now we have the tie. And the reason why I call this the tie is because Luke says this, 
Not only were they dedicated to the apostles' teaching, but they were also dedicated to the fellowship. Well, what does Luke mean there? Well, when he's talking about fellowship, he's talking about they were dedicated to being together. If you've got your Bibles open, go down to verse 44. It says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They were dedicated to being together. Now, this tie, this fellowship, I think has a special significance during this time of pandemic, during this time of quarantine, because we're not able to be together. And the church, as it was instituted, was designed to be together. And I know most of us are acutely aware that we're not able to be together. And if I were to ask you the question of, well, make a list of the, the top five things that you miss uh, from, you know, from how the world has changed with this pandemic, with, with being quarantined. I imagine many of you would say that one of the things that I miss the most is just simply being with my brothers and sisters. It has reminded us of how much we, 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 we receive and how much we're able to give from being together. We're able to encourage each other. We're able to understand better each other's needs and be able to help take care of those needs when we're together. Obviously, we can't be together right now, but what is the lesson that we need to learn going forward about this simple part of, of being a church, of being a child of God? Well, the lesson that I need to take to heart is that it's so important to be together that I need not limit that to just the times that we have officially scheduled meetings. But also, I need to spend more time with my brothers and sisters in Christ outside of worship time, outside of class time, because it's so vital that we spend time together. And I need to remember that going forward as now I am yearning for that because I miss it so much because we're not able to be together. The Apostle Paul in two different places, uh, in Romans chapter 12 and in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, talked about the church being a body. And in Romans chapter 12, verses 4 and 5, he says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. So though many are one body in Christ and individually members of one another, just in describing us as a body that we all need each other, meaning that we need to work together, we need to be together. And in 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12, he says, for just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. Again, emphasizing that we to function as one body, we need to work together, that everyone is equally important in the roles that they play. But, but again, the church was intended to be together. And while, again, we can't be together right now, the thing that I want to remember and that I hope you will remember is that once we're able to be together, make the most of every opportunity to be together with your brothers and sisters in Christ. So we see that they were dedicated to the truth that it comes from God's word. They were dedicated to the tie of fellowship. The third thing that I want you to write down is the phrase, the table, the table. The third thing that Luke tells us is that it says they were dedicated to the apostles teaching. They were dedicated to the fellowship and they were dedicated to the breaking of bread. Now, the phrase, the breaking of bread in scripture uh, can mean a couple of different things. In, in some cases, when you see the phrase breaking of bread, it's talking about enjoying just a meal. And you actually see that same thing in this, in this chapter. If you go down to verse 46, it says, day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. That's in verses 46 and 47. So in that case, they were enjoying meals together. But, but if you read like in Acts chapter 7, later on, sorry, Acts chapter 20 in verse 7, later on in Acts, we read about the church at Troas that was observing the Lord's Supper. And it says on the first day of the week, uh, this is in verse 7, the first day of the week when we were gathered together to break bread, meaning to observe the Lord's Supper. And I think that's what uh, Luke is talking about here, that they were dedicated to observing the Lord's Supper that Jesus instituted with his disciples, the men that would be his apostles in the upper room uh, before he was crucified. And it says they were dedicated to this. And 
you know, this is something that has taken on a different form now that we're being forced to worship from home, you know, that we can't be together to observe the Lord's Supper. But I hope that you're still observing the Lord's Supper in your homes with your family because, you know, in some senses, this is the centerpiece of our worship. And why is that? Because it represents the thing. It represents the reason why we're doing any of this to begin with. You know, without Christ's death and resurrection, there would be no reason to do any of this. There would be no reason to, to follow him. There'd be no reason to have a church. And so we are remembering and celebrating the very reason why we are Christians, the very reason why we exist as a church. And so I hope that you are continuing to observe the Lord's Supper with your family. I hope that you are taking that as an opportunity to remember this fundamental idea of why we do the things that we do, why we live the way that we do because of what Jesus did for us in his death, his, his resurrection. And so I hope you're still making the most of that and you will continue to do that when we're back together to remember, not just to kind of casually go through this as something that we do every week, but to use this as an opportunity to remember what Jesus did for us. So we've been through three of the four. Uh, they were dedicated to the truth that comes from God's word. They were dedicated to the tie of fellowship. They were dedicated to the table and observing the Lord's Supper. And finally, Luke tells us this. They were dedicated to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread. And then finally it says they were dedicated to the prayers. And I think this simply means that they were a praying people, that they approached the throne of God through prayer. And, you know, in this idea of thinking about simplicity as it relates to our relationship with God, our functioning as a church, you know, it's a time to step back and to, to think about what an incredible privilege it is that we have an avenue to speak and to petition and to praise the creator of the universe. You know, this is such an important aspect of our of our Christian life that Jesus, when he was preaching the Sermon on the Mount, and specifically in Matthew chapter 6, he gave a model prayer for, as an example, for those disciples to know how to pray because it's such an important thing. And he begins that prayer in Matthew 6 verse 9 by saying, pray like this, our Father in heaven. And I'm going to stop there because we, most of us know this prayer, but just being able to call God Father and to have access to God through prayer is an incredible privilege. And just like in thinking about this, this period where most of us probably have more time available in, in rededicating ourselves to the study of God's word, what about using this as a time to rededicate ourselves to, to being people of prayer, to making the most of the time that we have in speaking to God? And, and as Jesus gave example in this model prayer of offering up praises to God, of making specific petitions of God, of things that we need, uh, of doing those things that help uh, demonstrate our, our praise to God, that help demonstrate our faith in Him, and, and also that, that allows us to, to ask for things, to ask for mercy at the throne of the Creator of the universe. What an incredible privilege that is. And so, you know, again, while there are this is a time of so many challenges and so many difficulties and so many worries and stresses. And, and you know, it, it's hard. It, it would be easy to get bogged down in thinking about how everything just seems to be going poorly. But maybe this is giving us an opportunity to, to take a breath in both in our personal life and in our spiritual life to, to take that opportunity that we were able to breathe and say, can I simplify? Can I simplify my personal life? Can I simplify my spiritual life? And can I refocus on those things that are most important? In my spiritual life, can I refocus on the truth? And that is making the daily study of God's word a part of my life. Can I refocus on the tie, the fellowship? And while we can't fellowship now, Making that a priority when we're able to do it again because we know how much we miss it and we know how much we miss the encouragement that we receive from each other, how much we miss knowing about each other's needs and being able to, to help take care of those needs uh, and making that a priority when we're able to be back together. To be able to focus on the table, 
and now it, it has a different form than it, than it hopefully will later. But, but using that time when we're observing the Lord's Supper to really focus on that we're honoring the reason why we're together, the reason why we put on Christ to begin with, the reason why we serve God rather than ourselves, because Jesus came here as God himself and died for us and making the most of that opportunity to celebrate that every week. And finally, as an opportunity to, to approach God's throne in daily prayer. Now that we have more time, that we have more time to study, we also have more time to pray. And let's make the most of that opportunity to pray. And as I close, I wanna challenge all of us, myself included, that over the next week, let's think about those four things, the, the truth, the tie, uh, the table, and the throne. And say, how can I refocus myself on those four things that those first Christians, the first church, that they were focused on? How can I focus on those things over the next week and rededicate myself to those things? Good morning, Mary, your church family. As we approach the end of the month of them not being able to meet and worship together, the elders want you again to thank you for participating in an unusual but necessary way of meeting for our worship. We have said and will continue to say how much we miss each other and long for this time, the time when we can come back together to worship and fellowship together. I want to take just a few minutes to thank our staff for the amazing work they continue to do. To Vera and Kayla for keeping up with our church family's needs and continuing to keep us informed. To Dylan, Lisa, and Karen for reaching out to our children and our youth group and their families, providing ways to spend valuable time together as they continue to study their curriculum and engage in other activities. To Blake and Daniel and Stephen for planning and preparing our worship videos and to so much more that they do day in and day out. Also to Blake and Daniel for the messages, the great messages they've been presenting for us uh, these weeks. And I want to take a special thanks to Chris Aiken and, and uh, Wyatt Ranty for the Bible class lessons that they've been presenting each week and others that have participated in, pre in preparing these videos. I hope you have been encouraged and have gained some feeling of being connected through these worship meeting videos. I also want to briefly mention that the shepherds are meeting via the Zoom video conferencing to pray and discuss other issues that need to be addressed. Utmost in our discussions is the how and when we might be meeting together again and what steps we would need to take to be safe and comply with any ongoing restrictions. I know we all miss being together 
but we're committed to our safety and well-being and we'll be overly cautious as we make decisions about that time when it comes. There seems to be a little light at the end of the tunnel, so we will continue to monitor our civil authorities and health experts about coming back together safely. Also, I want to thank Tim for his special thoughts about Dr. Conley. We not only lost a great friend, but a spiritual giant. Marlon Conley's 31 years of ministry have helped lay the foundation for this congregation. And that influence continues to this very day. He'll be missed by many. Again, I wanna thank you for participating in our time of worship this morning and for the time that we'll continue to do this. So I'd like to now lead us in a prayer as we close. Father, we, we bow before you, each in our own separate places, thankful for your great love for us, thankful for the blessings of life and the many things that you provide for us. We know they come from you. We feel your presence. We thank you for the protection you've given us for the safety we know we have and the health of our family. We pray for your continued intervention in the situation we find ourselves in now. Pray that you would bring a swift end to this uh, crisis, this virus situation that we're enduring. Father, help us as we hear the ongoing news and updates day to day, the alarming ones and the positive ones. Help us to stay focused on you, Father. That's our prayer, that you would keep us focused on you. As we live through this difficult time, nothing can be more important than that. Father, we pray for guidance in the days to come as we again unite in one place. Pray that you would bring us together safely as we worship you together again. We ask for your wisdom as we decide about those issues that we need to, as we go forward. Father, we, can, we ask you to continue to bless each one of us. We thank you for the gift of your Son, our Redeemer, and our Savior. We pray in his holy name, in Jesus' name, amen.